Okay, so hi everyone. Um, welcome to the last day, or I guess close to last day of the conference. Um, and today we're going to talk about a very interesting uh, subject in my mind, uh, which is a mixture of two technologies that I've used a lot, that we see used a lot in the community, which are both Cluster API and Keda. Uh, but using them together is something that typically is less seen in the way that we're going to talk about today. Um, but we'll see exactly uh, why we're talking about this and what kind of the general idea is in a moment. So just for a moment, a bit about myself. My name is Scott Rosenberg. Uh, I live in Israel. I'm the lead architect in the CT office at TerraSky, a global solutions integrator, uh, working mostly myself in the Kubernetes and platform engineering spaces. Uh, been a Kubernetes contributor for around five years. Next week it will be five years. Uh, sysadmin for 10 plus years and my passions in life are Torah, which is Bible, uh, whiskey and Kubernetes exactly in that order. That is my passions in life and whiskey with an E is not whiskey. Uh, and even though I'm American uh, and I'm known as the rabbi uh, over the networks, I started my career with VMware VRA and therefore it just made sense. Um, so we, again, we're a global solutions integrator and we work a bunch of places. We're a CNCF member. Um, and let's talk a bit about why we're here today. So Cluster API, who here, by the way, is familiar with Cluster API? Awesome. So we're going to give a basic kind of overview on Cluster API uh, and then jump into things just to level set. So Cluster API is an official subproject of Kubernetes. It's part of the special interest group of Cluster Lifecycle. Um, and what does it do? So Cluster API basically offers us declarative APIs using Kubernetes CRDs that allow us to define and manage Kubernetes clusters across many different infrastructures using many different distributions of Kubernetes, different bootstrapping mechanisms, and allows us to do this in a unified and manageable way. Um, many think of it as inception because we're using Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes. Um, it does bring it challenges and a lot of benefits to it though as well. Uh, Cluster API is a pluggable platform. Uh, the idea is that we have different plugin types, which are called providers. We have infrastructure providers, we have bootstrap providers, control plane providers, IPAM providers, add-on providers, where the idea is we have a core cluster API, or which I will probably start calling at some point CAPI because I'm sick of saying the full name and that's how we all call it. But CAPI has the core and then it has a pluggable model that allows it to work really with any infrastructure as long as a provider exists and makes it very extensible. Um, cluster API is becoming the de facto standard for deploying clusters via fleet managers and multi-infra distributions. We're seeing this from the likes of Rancher that are implementing cluster API. Um, we're seeing that from Tanzu, from VMware by Broadcom now. We're seeing that from things like SpectroCloud and D2IQ, which is now part of Nutanix. We're seeing that from many, many different distributions. Even OpenShift uh, uses what's called the Machine API, which is based off of the APIs of Cluster API, V1 Alpha 1, and are implementing Cluster API, but they're moving also towards Cluster API as a full concept. So it's really becoming the de facto standard that we're seeing for how to manage Kubernetes clusters. Um, and it's become very powerful because of that. It has a lot of vendors that are contributing to it. So it's a very active community. If we take a look at the idea of cluster API, really we have first our infrastructure providers. These would be things like vSphere, AWS, Azure, Google, Nutanix, OpenStack, Proxmox. There are 32 official infra providers and I know of at least 10 other ones that are not official. Uh, both companies that have built their own as well as ones that simply are not registered within Cluster API as official providers yet. Uh, we have bootstrap providers, how we bootstrap Kubernetes. So the most standard one in the entry provider that's provided by the Cluster API community itself is KubeADM. Again, a sub-project of Kubernetes itself. Uh, but also Talos, MicroKates, K3S, EKS, AKS, GKE. So one of the benefits, Cluster API used to mean only self-managed Kubernetes, but now we also have the ability to support EKS, AKS, GKE, other ones as well. Um, so the ability to manage the managed services in the same way is very beneficial as well when we're looking at multi-cloud scenarios. We then have our control plane provider, and this is what's going to actually give us a Kubernetes control plane. 
This is where things really differ. We have things like kubeADM, which is very standard in Talos. We also have things like Kamaji, which Kamaji is a very interesting uh, CNCF project, which basically gives us the experience when I'm self-managing. I don't see the control plane in my cluster. It runs as pods in a management cluster. I do not actually see them. So it's very similar to EKS, AKS, and GKE, where you don't see your control plane. You only see your worker nodes. And we actually co-locate all the control planes onto one shared backend cluster. The same thing can happen with tools like Kamaji. So we really have a lot of freedom here in how we manage our clusters. Um, also, things like I didn't mention, but EKS Anywhere, Google Anthos, also built on cluster API. Um, how would we set up a cluster API environment? Very simple. It's a single command, cluster cuddle in it, and we tell it what info providers I want, what bootstrap provider, what control plane provider. You can have many infrastructure providers, many control plane providers, and many bootstrap providers all in the same cluster. So very often what we'll see by our customers is that they'll actually have one cluster and from a single place manage clusters in multiple clouds in a unified manner. They don't need to have separate management because of the different clouds. They can have one central control plane and from there actually go and manage any clusters in any different environment. Um, if we take a look kind of at the general uh, idea of how cluster API works, we can have our different uh, you know, targets, which are different infrastructure. There's also bare metal providers with like canonical mass. Um, but we have a few core resources. So we have a cluster resource. That's our main resource that defines a cluster. But there are some infrastructure specific things, like how a load balancer is created for that cluster, for the control plane. That's why a cluster references a infrastructure cluster. So that would be AWS cluster, CRD, or Azure cluster, or vSphere cluster, or Nutanix cluster, or whatever. We then have our control plane, which is just from the control plane provider. There is no object of core CAPI for the control plane. It's just referenced from within the cluster. And then we have machines, machine deployment, machine set. Very similar to deployment, replica set, and pod. A machine deployment will create machine sets, which will create machines, which end up being our worker nodes. Or machines can be created directly from the control plane if it's a machine-based control plane of Kubernetes. Um, we always have our bootstrap config and our infrastructure machine as well. Why? Because depending on how we're bootstrapping, maybe we're using Talos, which is going to use Ignition, or we're using kubeADM that's going to use Cloud Init. So depending on how we provide that bootstrap, so we're going to have a bootstrap config and an infrastructure machine that's going to say which region, which VPC, which subnet I'm connecting this machine to, where am I deploying it, any of the AWS specifics, let's say, or different infra specifics. We also have a huge thing called machine health checks, which is a way that we can have cluster API come and check that our nodes are healthy. And if a machine isn't healthy, instead of saying, hey, go figure out why there is an issue in the machine. It's just going to go, market is unhealthy, create a new machine, drain the old machine, delete it, and you're done. So it's basically an idea of where we can treat our Kubernetes clusters and our nodes within our clusters as cattle and not as pets. Right? So the same ideas that we've been told about Kubernetes, we can now, about pods and our applications, we can do also for our Kubernetes clusters now. And that's kind of the idea of cluster API. If we take a look at it from a very simple example, um, this is, for example, we can see the only difference in these two is obviously the name and the class that I'm using. Which template of all of these different manifests do I want to use? We can create a vSphere cluster and an AWS cluster by literally changing a single line from an end user perspective. We as platform engineers, as info, as operations, have, <coughs> excuse me, have built the templates in the back end that tell it what this means, where you get deployed. And we can expose things as well as variables so we can make it as customizable or as locked down as we want for our end users to allow self-service creation of Kubernetes clusters. And this is a very standard example. If we take a look, uh, cluster cuddle also gives us a great command called describe, which allows us to show the whole resource hierarchy of what a cluster looks like. So we're going to start with our cluster, which has, in this case, I'm using CAPD, the cluster API provider for Docker. 
basically it spins up kind clusters with multi nodes, but it allows for easy testing of cluster API. Um, and so what we're doing here, we have our cluster infrastructure, which is a Docker cluster. We have a control plane provider, which has templates, and it has a machine, which references a machine and a config. And all this was created by just that one manifest of cluster that I created, and all these other resources were created for me. And this, this is the Kubernetes management cluster view of what a workload cluster looks like, or what a typical Kubernetes cluster is managed as. The benefit of doing this is that we get full reconciliation. We get the benefits of Kubernetes of the consistent reconciliation loop happening for our Kubernetes clusters as well, which is extremely beneficial. Unlike other tools like Terraform, OpenTofu, where it's a one shot and any time that you apply, it'll do drift detection. We get consistent drift detection and uh, reconciliation here. Now, one of the things that has always been interesting to me in the uh, Kubernetes world is auto-scaling. And for many years, we had really one option um, for cluster auto-scaling, and that was cluster auto-scaler. Um, it's by its name, it's pretty simple what it does. Uh, it auto-scales clusters, uh, and it is a sub-project of Kubernetes as well, part of SIG auto-scaling. And when we looked at auto-scaling, one of the biggest challenges was actually in the on-premise world, which is where I started from as well most of my time in the industry. And what we saw is that the issue is we, if you don't have in your infrastructure the idea of like a auto-scaling group, an ASG and AWS, or machine sets like we have in different providers, there is no way to actually do auto-scaling. And there weren't, for example, on vSphere, on Nutanix, on Bare Metal, on Canonical Mass, there was no way for me to actually get auto-scaling from for my Kubernetes clusters. That is where Cluster API became very beneficial because one of the things that was built within Cluster Autoscaler is actually a Cluster API provider, where instead of talking to the cluster, to the cloud itself, the cloud now becomes Cluster API. And what it does is it scales the machine deployment, which is my amount of workers that I need. So it will just scale a resource in Kubernetes and let Cluster API handle what that means in terms of creating a machine, deleting a machine, in AWS, Azure, Google, whatever it is, we don't need the autoscaler to talk to the cloud. Cluster API already does that for me in provisioning. Let Cluster Autoscaler just talk to Cluster API, and then we've abstracted it from the cloud and made it so no matter which infrastructure I'm running on, we can use the same autoscaler, which makes it really easy to maintain. So Cluster Autoscaler does automatically adjust the size of our clusters. Um, in two cases, there are pods that failed to run in the cluster due to insufficient resources. That's case one. What will it do? Scale up. Or there are nodes in the cluster that have been underutilized for an extended period of time that we define, and it will scale down. Very simple. What is the issue with this? It's a reactive auto-scaling. Typically, what that, what that means is we are going to lose certain requests or we are going to have bad latency at a certain point in time because I ran out of resources and pods need to come up. Hold on, wait, let me go create a machine, which depending on the cloud and infrastructure can take some time for the CNI to be initialized on the node, for daemon sets to be initialized on the node, for everything to work. It gets even worse in the GPU world where we need different drivers installed through things like the NVIDIA GPU. Uh, operator and it can become a mess and this can really affect us but this was the first and most common way that we see of auto scaling and this was brought to cluster api as well so it has a provider mechanism which is very powerful um, and it performs it against the cloud's apis and that so cluster as mentioned it does have the cluster api provider um, and basically, the way that we can define minimums and maximums, which typically you would do on like the auto scaling group, is actually done just via annotations on your machine deployment, where you say min replicas, max replicas for a machine deployment. And based off of that, it's going to scale them. You could have multiple machine deployments in a cluster as well for different types of node pools, right? For small nodes, big nodes, GPU, non GPU. Windows, if you want to suffer through life and have Windows nodes in Kubernetes, I really do not recommend it, but there are people who are masochists and it is possible. Um, but otherwise, for different Linux uh, distributions where you want to stay sane, um, it is possible. And there is also support for scale from zero as well, 
Um, so we can also scale down to zero. It requires a few additional pieces of metadata that we need to add in, saying, for example, what the machines that will come up from this machine deployment are going to look like in terms of amounts of CPU, amounts of memory, which architecture they're going to be, so that Cluster Autoscaler can say, OK, I actually need two of these to suffice what you're requesting right now. Because if it's zero, it doesn't have a node to actually look at and understand what that's going to be. Um, so again, this is what it looks like, cluster X, K, X, I, O, cluster API, autoscaler, node group, max size, min size, very easy. That's the way that we do autoscaling traditionally. Recently, in the last year or so, a bit more, but Carpenter has become the new kid on the block in the autoscaling world of clusters, originally created by AWS, donated uh, over the past year to SIG autoscaling as part of Kubernetes. Um, and Carpenter is a new approach of cluster autoscaling. Carpenter is very commonly used, um, and the core of it is an official subproject of Kubernetes, and it has a plugin model as well. So there is a AWS provider and an Azure provider currently that are production grade, that are GA, um, where you can actually do autoscaling in Azure or in AWS. Unlike Cluster Autoscaler, though, Carpenter providers are out of tree. And this is a big thing that we went through. Anyone that works in the Kubernetes ecosystem and has seen the move to out of tree of CSI and CPI and seen how all of that has been really fun for everyone, both the maintainers and the implementers and the users, um, will understand why this sounds very good to me, an out-of-tree mechanism where we're not actually embedding all of the cloud provider's logic into a single binary in the end that gets deployed everywhere. Um, it makes it much better. So Carpenter follows this model as well and has out-of-tree providers for each one that live in their own dedicated vendor repos. So AWS have theirs and Azure have theirs. Currently, only AWS and Azure have production-ready providers, though. If we look, though, the cluster API community, in specific Michael McCoon uh, from Red Hat, um, has actually really started to push working on a cluster API provider for Carpenter, um, which over hopefully in the next week or so, we should be migrating it to the SIG cluster lifecycle as a official project. Uh, where myself and a few other people are, are the maintainers of this provider that we've been building, which is going to allow us to use Carpenter for Cluster API. It is already a working alpha state. Uh, it works if you are willing to get your hands dirty, um, but it is something that the Cluster API community are very interested in, and hopefully we will get this to a production state in the relatively near future. Um, and basically, the huge difference that exists with uh, Carpenter over Cluster Autoscaler is that it doesn't have set autoscaling groups. It doesn't have set node pools. It looks at what you're requesting and finds the most optimal node size that can be deployed from what you allow in order to fulfill your needs. It is going to do the optimal choosing of node sizes instead of just pre-creating node pools and scaling up those node pools, it actually creates just machines that are the right size for you. Um, so we actually get better uh, performance, we get better, we have less waste when we use tools like Carpenter. Carpenter in like AWS, their provider can also bring in like, okay, what do you want? What's more important to you, cost, speed, you can set different things, and based off of that, it's going to make its choices. It may choose a more optimal one because it's cheaper, or it may choose a one that's going to give it better performance. And so we can really play around with how it's going to use this algorithm to choose the right node for us. Um, and it's gained huge traction, especially in the AWS community. If we really look at the main differences between them, it's really these four points. Cluster Autoscaler relies on pre-configured node groups or autoscaling groups. Carpenter doesn't. It dynamically finds the right node size. Carpenter leverages Kubernetes provisioner custom resources for more fine-tuned management, which is great. It uses the Kubernetes model. Cluster Autoscaler, on the other hand, relies on cloud resources being pre-configured and on a bunch of flags 
that you set in the deployment YAML of Cluster Autoscaler and doesn't really use CRDs. There's one new CRD that was implemented for certain use cases, less used so far, but it basically relies on you setting flags to the process that's running within the deployment. Less optimal, less Kubernetes native, less declarative, easy to understand. Cluster Autoscaler supports over 25 different cloud and infrastructure providers, though. Carpenter only supports AWS and Azure so far. So in many cases, you have to use Cluster Autoscaler. Um, and this is why, AW, why Cluster API is such an important target in my mind for Carpenter, because it opens up the potential for anywhere. And Carpenter is faster at reacting to scaling requirements over Cluster Autoscaler. It is much faster at the reaction times, which does shrink the time it takes for a pod to be schedulable. The earlier we can send that request to create the node, the less downtime we have. But still, it is reactive. And that is once again an issue. Because again, we still have downtime. We may have shrunk the downtime, but we still have a period where I need a node and it is not there. And this is the issue that we're hearing from our customers consistently, um, that I am suffering from in my own environments, and that all of our customers are suffering from in all of their environments. If we take a step out for a second from cluster auto-scaling, there's an amazing project called Keda. Who here has used Keda before? Awesome. Anyone else heard of Keda? Awesome. So Keda is the Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaler. And basically, it is a wrapper around HPA or a manipulator of HPA that brings us really powerful things unlike HPA. Um, it is very powerful. Kega is traditionally used for workload auto-scaling, for auto-scaling deployments and stateful sets and things of that sort. Kega has over 50 different built-in scalers, as they call them, to support advanced use cases. What does this look like, for example? So Keda works with any Kubernetes resource, by the way, that implements the stash scale. But the key thing is that we're able to support things like, hey, based off of how many messages are in my Kafka right now on a specific topic, I want you to auto-scale my workload so that it consume them. How many things do I have in my RabbitMQ queue? How many certain records do I have in Postgres? Or in any different system, we can look at external systems. We don't need to scale my workload based off of CPU or memory usage. I can scale based off of any metric that I want. We can do Prometheus, New Relic, Datadog, any of these different APMs we can pull from them and pull them. Or we can do it off of external systems that it's going to query. For example, if we're a consumer of a Rabbit MQQ, we can say, OK, I know that I can process five messages at a time. If there are more than five messages in the queue, make sure that I have another replica so that I can do parallel processing as much as possible. Keda is a graduated CNCF project, which is very good because that means that the community believes in it and is using it. It monitors the rate of events to proactively scale any container, and it feeds the data into the Kubernetes API to drive scaling. It doesn't do the scaling for me. It passes that on typically to HPA to actually do that scaling job itself. It just manipulates it. Um, and it allows containers to scale to and from zero, something that HPA does not do, and it does, and it has these capabilities. As we mentioned, it does have an extensible and pluggable scaler to grab metrics from any event source. These are some of the most common ones used today, but things like GCP PubSub or AWS SQS, Rabbit, Kafka, Event Hubs, Service Bus, and as we mentioned, there are over 50 of them. So if we take a look at how this basically works, you have your Keda operator, you have your scalers, you have, sorry, it did not look good here. Uh, we have our metrics API and HPA. Um, and what happens is, is we have some event source, I have a deployment, and then I have a scaled object. And the scaled object will target a deployment or anything that has, as mentioned, a slash scale sub-resource like a deployment does. And basically it says what the polling interval is and which triggers I want it to trigger off of. So here I'm saying a specific broker on the consumer group in this topic with a lag threshold of 50. And that basically controls how aggressive Kata is going to scale this based off of how many messages I have. We basically apply the 
scaled object in our deployment to our cluster. And based off the amount of messages, we're going to get auto scaling of our deployment. Yay, very cool. Uh, that's all documented, though, everywhere. And I wouldn't be here to talk about something like that. So what we're actually here to talk about is K9 Cluster API. And why does this interest me? Well, the question came up of Kega allows us to actually do preemptive auto scaling. Because I can choose what I want to auto scale off of, I can also choose that I want to auto scale when I know that I'm about to reach a problematic state. I can say, hey, when you reach 80% of CPU capacity, scale up. I don't need to wait for 100% to be filled in for a pod not to be able to be scheduled. I can say, OK, when you get close to the limit, start scaling. So we can start doing things before we hit the issue rather than reactively. And so this question came up. And cluster API machine deployments do implement the slash scale sub resources, making them fully compatible with Keda. This means that no matter which cloud provider I'm in, if I'm using Cluster API to manage my clusters, I can use Keda now to auto scale my Kubernetes clusters. Keda can be easily integrated with our CAPI cluster for node auto scaling at the machine deployment level using any of the 50 plus scalers. Now, many of them don't make sense. You typically won't scale a Kubernetes cluster based off of Kafka. Uh, you may if you have some weird use cases. Um, but often you would off of, let's say, metrics in an APM system, or metrics in Prometheus, or off of different use cases that we'll see in a moment. Keda can even be used in conjunction with the cluster autoscaler for advanced use cases. It's not an either or, actually, if we know how to configure things correctly and make sure that we aren't stepping on each other's toes. Because I have done that before. Your cloud builds do not get happy when you get it wrong, but when you get it right, it can be very helpful. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So what are the use cases? Keda has a cron scaler that basically just says, hey, at this specific time, based off of crons, when it's supposed to scale to certain numbers and when not. Well, this can be used against our CAPI resources to scale down dev clusters during off hours to save money. We've done this by a lot of our customers that in peak out in, for example, weekends or at nights, scale down the dev clusters to one worker node. When at 8 a.m., because people come in at 9 a.m. to work at 8 a.m., scale it back up. So when they get there, all their pods are running. But why did I need to pay for extra nodes for 12 hours of the day when no one is there if it's a dev cluster? So there are many use cases that we can use this for. Kedda's scalers can be used, such as there's a great one called PredictCube, which is a SaaS offering that basically allows us to do uh, forecasting based off of different metrics. And we can use the PredictCube scaler, for example, for predictive auto scaling of Kubernetes clusters instead of reactive. So I can use PredictCube's forecasting capabilities based off of the metrics we ingest to it from Prometheus, and then come and basically say, OK, it will understand when it should auto scale based off of heuristics and previous knowledge that it has, it will come and actually predictably auto scale in advance for us. So there are really interesting use cases that we can bring once we get into the Keda world. Now, one of the important things with Cluster Auto Scaler is that we mentioned there's the minimum and maximum settings that we set, whether it's at the ASG level or if it's on the machine deployment in Cluster API. Cluster Auto Scaler took a decision that I used to not like, and now I really do like because of this which is that if your machine count is outside, either below or above what the range is that Cluster Auto Scaler is managing, it says, OK, I'm not touching it. It won't do anything if you're outside of the range. If you're within the range, it's going to auto scale. But the second it's outside, it says, I'm not touching it. What does this allow us to do? What we do in a lot of dev clusters is we say from 3 to 20, whatever the number of nodes is, is the range of Cluster Auto Scaler. And what we'll do is we'll actually have Keda come and bring it down to one during off hours. And this allows them to work together. So we can actually use Keda and its cron scheduler to schedule below. And cluster auto scaler is going to scale in between. 
And then we can set predict cubes so that when we need to scale above cluster autoscaler, because there's a prediction that there's some big burst where close to a release, there's going to be a lot more testing happening, a lot more environments coming up, it can bring it out of the range of cluster autoscaler. Above it, cluster autoscaler, again, won't touch it and we can move back. So we have a lot of different options here of how we do this, always very different based on the use case, but the options really are endless because we have so many scalers. And in the end, if you can write a PromQL query, which you know is not a fun task to do, but it is very possible to write very complex PromQL queries, as long as you can express it through a query to an APM or in PromQL, for example, against Prometheus, you can scale off of that. And that is extremely powerful if we use it correctly. So that's basically the way that KEDA and Cluster Autoscaler can work together by manipulating those counts. And KEDA and Cluster Autoscaler and CAPI is an example. So if we look at our machine deployment, for example, the way that we set this up is for my machine deployment, I'm simply setting the annotation saying min size 3, max is 10. And that basically says, wonderful, go and do your thing. And then all we're going to do is create another resource of our scaled object. We can see here, I'm saying during certain hours what I want it to scale to, other hours what I want it to scale to, basically the beginning of downtime, the end of sleep time, and the rest of that is going to be managed. So we bring it out of range, we bring it back in range, and now Cluster Autoscaler does its typical thing. So this is if you wanted to still use Cluster Autoscaler but get these benefits, very easy to implement. Now, like with anything, there are pros and cons. And I luckily do not work for a vendor, so I can be completely honest about the terrible and wonderful things about anything because I don't answer to anyone on that. So let's talk about the key challenges. Um, KEDA does not have the same deep knowledge and integration with the Kubernetes scheduler. What Cluster Autoscaler does, basically, there's a reason that Cluster Autoscaler has to be the same version of Kubernetes, technically, as you're actually running. It doesn't need to be, but it should be, and that is the supported mechanism. The reason is they actually fork the Kubernetes scheduler and basically make some changes to it, but it's actually embedded inside the Kubernetes scheduler. So it's using the same logic of the Kubernetes scheduler to make its auto-scaling decisions. Keda doesn't have that. That doesn't mean a scaler couldn't be built that would do the same idea, but it doesn't have that today. So because it has less deep integration with the Kubernetes scheduling process, there's a lot of, I would say, mappings that you have to make in your mind. Uh, and a lot of additional work sometimes that you have to figure out in rough edges because it wasn't purposely built for this use case. Right? Keda must run in the management cluster because it's targeting a machine deployment. Keda cannot target other clusters with what it is scaling. And that can be a pro or con depending on how you manage your cluster API environments. Some people like to run cluster autoscaler in the workload cluster. Others, which is the way that I've always done it, you can run in the management cluster. But depending on who you want managing the cluster autoscaler, if it's a tenant, then does the tenant have access to the management cluster to manage the cluster autoscaler? It gets into questions uh, at that level, but that is a limitation here. Um, and as mentioned, KEDA is not purpose-built for cluster autoscaling. That means we do have to do those mental conversions a lot of the times, because when we read the docs, we will not find KEDA currently KEDA as a cluster autoscaler. We will not find that use case not in cluster API and not in KEDA. This is my own thinking that has proven itself successful in many customers, but still is not a, let's say, normal use case that is fully documented by either community um, because it's still a relatively new idea um, that we're starting to talk about. So what are the key benefits, though? We've talked about the cons. Let's talk about why we would do this, though. We can use the same tool for all auto-scaling needs, helping to enforce the cattle approach for our Kubernetes clusters as well. By having a single tool, this lowers also the toil and learning of new tools and understanding the intricacies. We can have one tool to manage auto-scaling. Makes things much easier if I can throw out one tool out, especially in the CNCF world where we have too many tools. Um, 
predictive auto scaling instead of reactive can allow for better handling of those peak workloads. Right? As long as we set up our predictive auto scaling correctly, this can be really, really beneficial. Um, we've seen examples of this in uh, you know, different systems where there's a long processing of new requests that are going to come in and all of a sudden they're going to scale or there's an event that you know you're a ticketing system you're a you know ticket seller or something like that and right before you go you know you're about to publish an event for a beyonce concert or whatever people listen to today i don't listen to normal cultural music um but there's some big artist that's about to do a show and you have the tickets being sold on your platform you know that the second that that goes live your site is going to be hit very hard well, you can set up predictive auto scaling based off of when an event is going to go live and based off of the amount of people that are joining, that are the amount of tickets that you're selling, you can auto scale to support that right away, right? So we have very powerful capabilities here that we can use. Scheduled auto scaling to zero or low instance counts in dev environments can save a lot of money <laughs> because anytime a node is up, the cloud providers say thank you. Um, Keda's extensive set of scalers makes nearly anything possible in this area. It's just a question of how complex it's going to be for you to figure out the exact knobs. But it's almost all going to be pretty easy to understand once you've done one or two implementations of this. Right? Once you get the handle of it, once you learn Keda, once you learn Cluster API, it becomes pretty easy to maintain and pretty easy to do. So with that, uh, are there any questions on the implementation here? Um, also, while that, I will just put this up if anyone wants to stay Calendly, whatever. If anyone is interested in this and wants to just talk, feel free to reach out. I always like geeking out on technology and talking, so feel free to do it. And yeah, but um, anyways, are there any questions? I know I talk fast as well. Oh, so. it, was, it was really emotional, let's say. <laughs> yes, I am passionate about certain things in life, and Kubernetes is the third most, but yes. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all. Yes? So, what about specific use cases? So, the specific scaling mechanism is just to have people who are using the web application. Yeah. So the main use case that we've so far used this with is dev clusters, of bringing them down during off hours to really save money, um, because that is a very big use case where our customers do not like paying for cloud consumption. Um, and also in on-premise environments, actually, that's big as well, especially um, we've had customers that run large you know, BI processes at night or banking companies that have large processes that run during crunching numbers during certain hours. So during that, we can actually scale down the dev environments and we can actually better utilize our on-premise resources because many people think auto-scaling doesn't belong on-premise. It belongs in the cloud because on-premise, you have a finite amount of resources, whatever you bought. But the answer is you can actually utilize those resources better if you were doing auto scaling, right? So that's been a huge use case that we've had by multiple customers where this has saved large amounts of money and these specific customers were AWS, but same thing works in Azure, Google as well. Um, so that's been where we've seen the most success from this so far because that's the easiest use case also to implement. It was the simple one that helped them from a FinOps perspective. Um, we've also seen success from this in certain other cases of like predictable scaling in gaming companies. Um, but you know, it's really a new idea. The biggest, I would say, failure that we had, um, I wouldn't call it a failure necessarily. I would call it a non-successful POC or a POC that didn't make it to production, uh, if we want to use politically correct uh, tools. Uh, in languages, um, but the, there were actually challenges with using this together with Cluster Autoscaler, um, depending on the provider of Cluster Autoscaler and how it was configured. There were some issues uh, that we bumped into. It is fixable, and I found the solution afterwards, but the POC was not successful because it took too long to figure out how you can actually integrate these things together, and it was not fun. Uh, but it definitely does work. Um, now and we've actually implemented that since. So, yeah. Yes. Some other scenario. Is it possible within the Keda scale 
at the same time up and down. So imagine the situation that we have the sporting sanctions and the on demand meat sanctions. We see that sports are cheap, so we want to move our workload to the sports and uh, decrease number of the on demand. Yeah. So it's definitely possible to do. Um, what you would have to do is just ingest those, those, that data of the pricing of AWS into some scaler that, for example, Keda would talk with. So you can easily ingest that type of data into something like Prometheus using a push gateway, using some type of mechanism that would push it in. And then based off of that, you can. Um, so again, it would just be very specific based off of which cloud you're using. So if you're using AWS, the whole thing would be simply building a solution that would bring in that data into a system that is queryable by Keda that can be used as a scaler, whether that be a Prometheus data dog, whatever. From there, very easy to implement. So we have not implemented that ourselves yet, but that is definitely a very simple thing, I would say, to solve. All these instances can be scaled down on their own, automatically. But you could also listen to that event and scale up a node reactively, right? Like, so you could, based off of what the amount is, and you say, okay, if you look and what the availability of spot instances is low in this region, I'm going to predictably, ahead of time, I'm going to scale up a machine deployment that is not of spot instances so that I'm being preemptive. Now, that may cost you a bit more money, but you're being safer, right, rather than the disruption. So there are ways of doing it. It would be very specific, though, and really it would depend on if you're using stateful workloads, I may recommend that less. If you're using non-stateful workloads, that may be recommended more. Depends on what type of workloads you're running and how long they take and how easy it is to drain them and things like that. Um, but yes. Exactly. Right. Now, Carpenter also itself has deep understanding of spot instances, the AWS provider. So I would first look at something like that, which has a lot of built-in capabilities around this, but Keda could also definitely be used. Awesome. Yeah. No, so that's a Carpenter AWS provider feature. Um, I don't believe that the Azure provider has implemented the same types of capabilities, but they could as well. Cluster API, we're having a lot of challenges in the feature group right now around this of figuring out how we would do that because we don't have a generic API like Cluster API that we could talk to to get the information of pricing of node types, to get this different type of data to actually do that. One of the ideas that has come up is actually to use open cost uh, as a unified CNCF project open source that we could actually use to integrate with and try and build something around that. It's still not there. We're at a very, very early state, but because OpenCost does have a plugin model where it does bring in costing data from the clouds and that, it seems like maybe that's something that could be done. It's come up as an idea, theoretical at this point. Um, but once we move it into Kubernetes SIGs, those are the type of things that I'm sure will be discussed in the meetings um, and hopefully we'll get there at some point. So that's overall going to be a challenge with any, right? Not just predictive. That's going to be an issue with any type of auto scaling. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically, in those cases, what happens is you'll set in the is you'll set in your auto scaling configuration a cooldown period before it scales down. So what you'll do is, for example, in cluster auto scaler, what we do is we set a cooldown period that even when you realize that nodes are not used and they can be tossed away. You have to wait 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, depending on what you set the flag to in the deployment to say, hey, only when this amount of period has passed, since the last scale up or since you notice that you need to be scaled down, only then do you scale down. Because I really do not want that consistent creation of nodes, which ends up 
costing a lot of times more money, especially in AWS for people that don't actually create the correct mechanisms to pull ECR from within the VPC network and actually go out to the internet. And then you end up with thousands of dollars of bills for pulling from ECR. And if you do that every time and your clusters are scaling in and out in different <laughs> demon sets are getting pulled, you're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so yes, that's very important. Cool down periods are possible in all auto scalers, though. So it's just a matter of configuring them correctly. Anything else? Awesome. So thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the conference.